Welcome to Elon Inc., Bloomberg's weekly podcast about Elon Musk. I'm your host, David Papadopoulos, and we are live at South by Southwest. For the uninitiated, Elon Inc. is the show where we discuss Elon Musk's corporate empire and how to make sense of his nonstop gambits and antics. Well, Elon Musk is now the richest person on the planet. More than half the satellites in space are owned and controlled by one man. Well, he's a legitimate super genius. I mean, legitimate. He says he's always voted for Democrats, but this year it will be different. He'll vote Republican. There is a reason the U.S. government is so reliant on him. Elon Musk is a scam artist, and he's done nothing. Anything he does yeah. is fascinating yeah. to people. Being here in Austin today, we'll dig into all things Elon in Texas. I'll let the man himself have the first word. This is Elon speaking back in 2022. We built the factory here in less time than it would have taken to get the permits in California. I love living in California, but the problem is you cannot get things done. Ask anyone, and anyone who's done a large project in California, uh, how long would it take you to get the approval to proceed? Two years and you're doing well. And like I said, we got this built in 18 months. Since moving to Texas a few years ago, Elon has bought up swaths of land, built new factories and facilities for his companies, even weighed in on a local election, and we'll get into all of that. But Texas has had an impact on Elon, too, and that is evident. Here we have him wearing a cowboy hat, maybe backwards? More on that hat later, but let me introduce our panel now. I'll start with one of our true regulars. Max Chafkin, senior reporter and editor at Business Week, and a man who is to this show what Norm is to Cheers. Hey, David. And then we have two special guests we brought in, Rachel Monroe, Texas Hi. and Southwest correspondent for The New Yorker. Hello, Rachel. Hello. And Sewell Chan, editor-in-chief at the Texas Tribune. Hi, David. Hello. All right, so an icebreaker to get things started. I want all of you, and I, I want you to think hard about this, I need you to rate Elon's Texanhood on a scale of one to ten, with one being a total utter imposter and ten being a modern day Sam Houston. Now, Sewell, you are a student of the history of Texas. We will start with you. And I'm writing down these answers, by the way. Well, it's a loaded question, but I'd have to say 10, and here's why. A 10. You know, Texas is a state where people have often come to reimagine themselves, and Texas is often a canvas upon which people project their desires, their dreams, or their nightmares about what America is and should be. So in one sense, the richest person in the world moving here, buying up giant swaths of land, buying up a state park, building a giant factory in Austin, okay. and proclaiming himself a Texan is the most Texan thing he could do. All right, very good. So we're going to jump more into that in one second, but we're going to get Rachel's number now. Rachel. I'll give him an eight, honestly. Texas loves a businessman. Texas loves a huckster. Texas loves a billionaire with, like, unhinged political opinions. Okay. I'll ding him a couple points because okay. of the hat, but. Okay. So we have a 10, we have an 8, max. Five. A five. Do I explain? No, or? Okay. no, no. They're cheating. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> no, we, you, will, you will explain during the course of the show, but we will then turn to you, Max. Okay. And I will ask you, how did Elon, a native South African, become a Californian first and a very proud one at that? And then a couple decades later, a Texan. Yeah, I mean, that clip is funny for me to watch as somebody who's covered him for a long time because, of course, like 10, 15 years ago, as you said, he was a proud Californian. It was like central to his identity. It was, in a lot of ways, his identity. He would, I remember like the, one of the first things he ever said to me, like in like 2006 or seven, when he was sort of talking up Tesla was, I'm a Silicon Valley guy. I think people in Silicon Valley can do anything. And the central premise was like, Silicon Valley is good at software, but doesn't build hardware. I'm going to be the one to fix that. And of course, he had this kind of change of heart around 2020 during COVID, like many tech guys, I think, who simultaneously uh, had huge capital gains windfall and were, I, I think, looking for ways to lower their uh, tax liability and also was very frustrated with uh, lockdowns and then began this kind of evolution that saw him move to Texas and I think, you know, change kind of his whole persona. All right. And Sewell, explain for us a little bit here 
the allure of Texas, a place that's long attracted libertarians and sorts like that? Well, first of all, it's important to remember that Texas has always been conservative, but Texas has not always been Republican. And indeed, in, across the 20th century, California was largely Republican and Texas was largely Democratic. There were different parties back then, of course. But Texas, especially in the 20th century, an important thing, the majority of the population lives east of I-35, the easternmost third of the state. And the Texas Triangle, Houston, Dallas, Austin, has the vast majority of the population. So Texas is actually a pretty urbanized state. But the rural image and that frontier image, the cowboy, the rugged individualist, that became kind of Texas's defining identity in the 20th century. Along those lines, Rachel, is this move to Texas for Elon, is this largely, is this a branding thing or is there more to it than that? Well, you, could, you might also want to state the lack of a state income tax. It's a pretty huge and um, Texas likes to think of itself as a very business friendly state. And I mean, I think you've seen that in his experience here and the clip that you all played in terms of the regulation. I mean, what's been able to happen with SpaceX here has happened r really quickly and sort of alarmingly quickly. But I think that uh, and then I think there's something fun about there's a certain kind of performative masculinity and the cowboy image. I mean, Elon's not the only right. guy that we're seeing that put on the hat and the boots. It's also, you know, he's good at a few different things. You know, he's a really good, you know, manager of engineers. He's a good marketer. Uh, he's also very good at getting municipalities, local governments, and even national governments to write him gigantic checks or to, you know, cut him enormous tax breaks. And, 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 and by the yeah. way, similar to the way he does it with investors, right? I mean, investors have been yes. handing him lots of money for years. And it's really good if you're if if you want to, you know, extract a tax break out of a governor or a mayor or whatever to be a little flexible about your identity, to be willing essentially to embrace a new identity. You know, when he was a proud Californian, of course, part of what he was doing was reviving the Numi factory. This is the main Tesla factory in Fremont, California that he got for very little money that essentially took over this GM Toyota joint venture. And, you know, coming to Texas, he's been able to extract some, I believe, some pretty significant tax breaks. And, and he's done this all over the world, right? In China, in, um, in Germany. It's, it's like a big part of what he does is like find a way to sort of fit himself into policymakers' yeah. agenda yeah, and, yeah. and get paid for it. We're going to get into that in a minute. Let me ask you this, though, because I do know... I believe, and you were very excited, you saw your first Cybertruck ever yesterday. I did, and it looked, it sort of fit in, it, you know. It, yeah, it, it's, right. It's it's like, they're so big, but, you know, maybe the scale, you know, here is a little, a little more forgiving. Rachel, you've talked a little bit with me before about Elon's star power and the star power that he brings to Texas. What does that look like, and, and does that star power, does it matter in any meaningful way? I talked to a person that I know the other day who is the, the only person I know who's, who's friends with Elon, and I was just sort of asking him, I was like, what's the deal? Like, does this work out there in the scene? And he was like, oh, yes. You would think that once you were a billionaire, you would get over this, but people are still like, oh, yeah, no, I went with E to this. There's still a lot of swooning. I There's see. still a lot of... Uh, deference there's still a lot of like laughing laughing at his jokes even when they aren't funny um so i guess it you know I, I, but this is like within a cohort that i think is like his cohort that has come to texas right. with him right. whether that travels kind of outside that bubble i think is is right. less clear so yeah. that includes like members of the paypal mafia the people who've settled in in west austin yeah exactly the the, the sort of new austin tech scene I was just wondering, like, who is the... Because when he lived in California, you know, he's sort of hanging with the Hollywood scene. You know, he, he married twice, actually. Married a, uh, a, an actress, uh, kind of a Hollywood starlet. He sort of enjoyed that part of his identity. What is the Austin equivalent of that? The is, Austin it like, <laughs> is it Joe Rogan? Or like, what, <laughs> what's... what's uh, Joe Rogan and Alex Jones, is that the best that we've got? <laughs> it, uh, I don't think so. I don't like to think that that's true, but... I mean, from what I hear, there's just like a lot of sort of like private enclaves. That's sort of the scene that's happening here. It's not a lot of like cross-pollination with the, the kind of broader Austin community. What actually is Elon's ideology nowadays, if we have any sense? Is he a libertarian? Uh, is he more right-wing, sort of law and order guy? He likes to say that he's pretty much a centrist and everyone else 
has moved left. Any sense of where he stands in, in, uh, at this current time? I think like a lot of people who've moved rightward, you know, Elon Musk is fundamentally annoyed by what 30 years ago was called political correctness or now wokeism. Whether you agree with that critique or not, I think it's one that he's really glommed onto. He's obviously become a free speech absolutist. I would say his orientation is mostly libertarian. He tends to talk more about speech issues than about low tax, low regulation, low government services, which is really the Texas economic model. MAGA. I mean, his, his ideology is the ideology of Donald Trump. I think partly because MAGAism, or whatever you want to call it, has is politically salient and, and is popular with a large portion of the United States. Also, I mean, of course, like, Donald Trump and Elon Musk have a lot in common, right? They're both kind of, like, libertarian-inclined businessmen who are really interested in, as Sewell says, you know, saying what they want when they want. And, and there's even, you know, I think psychically some kind of connection. They're both given to these, like, you know, kind of grand pronouncements. They both have this feeling that they can kind of speak something into existence just by saying it very forcefully. So, I, I mean, I think it's that simple. I think his ideology is, is the ideology of the Trump movement. It's interesting to me that he seems to really think of himself as a, as a contrarian and as a maverick of some right. kinds. But if you, when you look at, you know, particularly the recent things that he's been saying about immigration, which is... We have some tape of mm. him at the border speaking on this very topic. We are at Eagle Pass, uh, and we're going to be uh, meeting with uh, uh, the sort of major, the major officials uh, uh, and uh, law enforcement are responsible for the water. The, re the reality is that um, it, this is an open border for all of Earth. All of Earth. Um, and just, you know, so there's roughly 350 million people in the U.S., but there's 8 billion people on Earth. Yes. This is an open border to 8 billion people. So yes. can I ask yeah, yeah. a question, though? I mean, at what point yeah. does Elon the capitalist run up against Elon the social media personality? I mean, someone running a global company wants a stable, large base of consumers. I think it's arguably happening. He feels he gets that under Trump? I mean, I think he's, like Tesla, there are big questions about why is there not more demand? You know, why does demand seem to slow down? You know, one explanation is that he's turned people off. I also think that Musk is on Twitter all day, every day, and uh, he feels intuitively, rightly or wrongly, that there's something behind this. And that's what he's uh, attacking. But of course, there are you know, large and very sophisticated investors who would disagree with that. I think he's making a huge mistake. I mean, it's just it's just interesting to me as a person who's been to Eagle Pass many times. Uh, yeah. I mean, first, like important to say that how divorced this is from reality. But again, it's like these aren't these aren't sort of like edgy contrarian opinions. This is like very standard kind of like Fox News divorced dad talking points like this is, you know, what you could. And it's interesting to me hearing you talk about him and California. I wonder if he's actually just much more of like a permeable person to his environment than he thinks. Like his idea of himself well, is that he he's has. a contrarian. I mean, he but. has. We've talked about this in the past a bit. There's a certain chameleon sort of aspect to him, no? Max? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, he, during the Bush years, the George W. Bush years, when he was just getting started, he kind of framed the companies in libertarian terms. During the Obama years, uh, he was a green capitalist. He 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 presented as a a centrist kind of somebody very much in line with Obama. I think he actually personally likes Obama quite a lot. And then during Trump, you know, he he shifted again. So I I think he's somebody who yeah who's pretty chameleonic politically. And also as Sewell said, you know, Silicon Valley is not ha has not historically been a liberal enclave. Like Silicon Valley is like. Defense Department, right. military, it, it was like a right of center place. So, so I think you could, I, and, and I think there is some quality of, of some of the tech guys who moved who sort of missed the like, you know, Silicon Valley of the 70s and 80s. And I, I yeah. you know, maybe Elon is part of that, even if they were kind of very small during that, at that time, but they, they at least miss it on some psychological level. Back to the border and back to his fixation on immigration and these topics. What has his impact been? Uh, Sewell on local politics? Well, let me start with the state level. So, you know, immigration is the biggest issue for Texans, and it's one reason why the state Republican Party continues to exert such a dominant hold on the state. But a lot of the local issues here that have been the most divisive actually are less about the border and more about things like privatization of the school system or very local issues like our attorney general who has, is under indictment and was impeached by the Texas House. 
And so there's kind of a civil war going on within the Republican Party that I don't think Elon is really part of. He did, however, recently take a position against Austin's uh, district attorney, who is a Democrat, who was running for re-election, and he urged people to vote uh, for the primary challenger, who was more centrist. And he kind of portrayed uh, the DA as kind yeah. of a Soros-backed prosecutor. But it was an intervention that came in way too late. Is that what went wrong here, that he just simply jumped in too late, that he, you, you can't rush in at the 11th hour and try to... And try to tip an election? Well, it's that. And simply, he also doesn't have much of a huge political voice here yet, right? I mean, as his workforce here grows, that might change. He, I was just also remembering that a, a few years earlier that Austin had a, a thing on the ballot, Proposition A, which was just sort of like a boosting, boosting police, you know, law and order kind of ballot that he tweeted in favor of. This was right after he had moved here. That also was like soundly defeated. Travis County, Austin has been, a, has like votes pretty liberal, votes pretty progressive, and whatever sway he has isn't nearly enough to, I mean, the the progressive um, incumbent that you're talking about, Sewell, like won by, you know, an enormous Is margin. That right? Yeah. So, right, for someone who's Leaving California and woke California for Texas. I mean, in some ways, Austin is indeed sort of an odd choice, no, within Texas? Well, if they, they all love living here because they want the culture of a thriving, you know, metropolis, like diverse yeah. place with good culture where, you know, people who make interesting things live. So, you know, that's but they also like think that, oh, you can come here and not pay the taxes, but get the kind of cultural capital of a place like this. That's right. And Austin is sometimes described as like the border city between blue and red America because you only have to go like 10 minutes outside mm. the city and you can hit Trump country really fast. And a lot of the people who've come here like like Musk, they stay in these gated communities that are actually pretty. They're kind of on the west toward the lakes and they're a little bit kind of outside the kind of downtown vibe that you're getting here at South by. You can look at his uh, the Elon Jet account, which is this account that, uh, you know, much to his dismay, like tracks his travel and I mean, you can see he spends a lot. He spends time here. I mean, he he's a guy who's sort of everywhere and nowhere, like many rich people. But he is spending quite a lot of time, I think, in Boca Chica, uh, which is you know on the border or close to the border near the SpaceX factory, and then and then here in Austin. Okay, so if so far it looks like he's not having a huge impact on local politics, his arrival in Texas and his more his takeover of Twitter, turning it into into X, his his constant presence there, is he, his seeming embrace of Donald Trump now, is he having or do we expect him to have a meaningful impact on national politics in this election year 2024? So people may be aware that there was this meeting, you know, in Palm Beach between Elon Musk and Donald Trump. There's some uh, suggestion, I guess, that Musk might, invest, uh, you know, donate money to Trump's campaign, which could really use the money. And then there, you know, then there is his sort of power as a as a media figure, as like essentially like a new age Fox News or a or a Fox News on steroids, right? I mean, Tucker Carlson, his main uh, distribution platform right now is X. Tucker still, uh, even though he's not on Fox, still has a big fan base. So I think there's some potential there. I do think there's this problem for Musk, which is that you know Twitter and people in this room will be aware of this. Twitter is not real life, and I think those of us who spend time. Um, in digital spaces are continually reminded of that. And, and I think, you know, this uh, endorsement that didn't go that well is, is yet another instance of that. Like, you can be tricked by social media into thinking that you are more popular than you really are. And I think if you're going to critique Elon Musk, that would be, you know, a critique. Got it. I mean, I think it's true that Twitter is not real life, thank God. But also, I do think that it's a way, particularly with the issues of immigration and the border, so many people do not live anywhere near the border. I, you know, I live like 70 miles from the border. So he's playing into this idea of creating an image in people's mind of what happens at the border, which becomes this hugely salient national issue that isn't actually impacting most people in any way, or is it maybe impacting them yeah. in like positive economic ways that they don't see, but he can sort of feed right. this idea of the, the chaos. Far more undocumented immigrants are people who flew into this country and overstayed their visas than crossed the border. But you wouldn't knowing that listening to his rhetoric. That said, does he affect swing voters in Michigan and Wisconsin? I doubt it. We shall see. I want to stay though on the along the border for a second. At this point, Musk between SpaceX, between Tesla, between Boring, um, Musk has a large, Musk Inc. has a large, fairly large presence here in Texas. 
in Boca Chica, along the border with Mexico, is perhaps one of the biggest spots, or maybe the biggest spot, where they have their spaceport. You've reported on this. Um, you've been there. Give us a little bit of a sense of what life is like there in Boca Chica and how it's been affected by Elon Musk and SpaceX's arrival. So Boca Chica is a very tiny little community outside Brownsville, right? Kind of on the on the beach where the Rio Grande flows into the Gulf of Mexico. So the very tip of Texas. And when I first went down there in 2019, it's, it's sort of like beach bungalow style, like retirees on fixed incomes. Like there was seashell art kind of type mm. of grandma scene. And um, Elon Musk went down there to sort of build these facilities for SpaceX. I mean, it's interesting because I live in West Texas where I live. Uh, it's very relatively close to where Blue Origin is. So Jeff Bezos builds, buys hundreds of thousands of acres mm. of land, right? You can't see anything that he's doing. Sometimes we would drive out and watch the launches, and they're just like a little dot happening oh, over I see. there. But okay. SpaceX was doing You're right this, on top of it. It's like you, it was crazy to go down there. They built the rockets before they built any buildings to build the rockets in. So you were just watching. I mean, with the sea, air, and sometimes the road was like washing out when the tides went a certain way. I mean, it was crazy to me that they were doing it and people there were just would just kind of come out and stare and watch and you could watch these rockets being built and so for a little while it, i think it felt like a, a paradise for right. people out there because this thing was happening i mean a paradise and a hell several years later what do they make of it so all those houses were sort of he he got kind of a sneaky deal that was able to get per possession of those houses through eminent domain which you know of course is supposed to be for things that are like for the public good like power lines is going to mars not for the public good <laughs> rachel <laughs> i guess it is what is going to save humanity so i can think of no higher right. cause um, and but it's so like, they were eminent domained out. They were eminent domained out. You know, the beach is closed down. It's, it, the houses is one thing, but it's it's important to talk about the beach there. This is a poor area of Texas. This is like one of the poorest metro areas in the United States. This beach was, it's one of the last undeveloped beaches in Texas. People described it to me with a lot of pride and affection as, as the poor people's beach. You know, you don't have to pay for parking. You go out there with your grandma and you fish. They've got, Texas has an open beaches law. Like we are sort of proud of our beaches and our access to our beaches. It's not like California in that way. Mm. However, SpaceX has this like special grandfathered in situation that they've worked out with the county there so they can close the beach. And so now this is it's just sort of become a private enclave. It's also right near all this, you know, protected wildlife land. And it's it was just this area that they kind of moved into, yeah. had a little spot and then have just grown to take grown. it over. And along those lines, so you guys at the Texas Tribune have reported some on a proposed land swap uh, between SpaceX and the state that would allow SpaceX to both hand over some land for protection elsewhere and take on right more land there well, right. in so, Boca Chica. So basically under this land swap, SpaceX would acquire basically what's currently a state park. And that pretty much shows you, and it's actually abuts a national wildlife refuge. So it's an ecologically sensitive area, a lot of biodiversity. And the fact that this deal is kind of moving forward actually says something, I think, powerful about how eager Texas governments are to kind of accommodate his wishes. And you guys have encountered a similar sort of sense of, hey, we're being essentially, we, the local community, oh, and in part in a Hispanic community, we're being bigfooted out. Absolutely. And you're also seeing that in one other big area in Texas, which is Bastrop County, right near Austin where Musk, as the Wall Street Journal reported, is kind of acquiring these huge, huge swaths of land. And now, of course, he's talking about building a private university. And even a few weeks ago, it was reported, potentially a new private Montessori-style school system. I do think, while Sewell was talking, I was thinking about, it's not just uh, the Texas government. It's not just, you know, I guess, like, Republican politicians right now are eager to please Musk. I mean, he is, he has power even over Democrats, right? Like even Joe Biden, Musk is really mad at Joe Biden because like Joe Biden like would snubbed him at an event and he's got like some Yeah, beef. I mean Biden didn't but Biden held an EV convention didn't invite Musk, the thing which is, is weird. like yeah. you know, even under Biden, even under the guy that he he despises and is you know insults, I'll call him a sock puppet, you know, he's maintained his contracts, he's even gotten more contracts. And when you look at like what the federal government, even the federal government under Democrats have done to Musk, it's not a whole lot. It's like it's like some enforcement actions and so on. But the contracts, the stuff that really matters has stayed because and I think the argument that some policymakers make is essentially that, you know, the U.S. government needs this guy like he is 
He is the leading industrials, better or worse. Is he too big to fail? Uh, yeah, I mean that's the that's the essence of it, right? That we, this country needs him too much. That he's too big to you know whatever to push around. I, I think there are questions about that, right? Wait, I wait. mean, maybe the companies are too big to fail. You could imagine a situation where the federal government went after Musk personally in a big way. Um, but again, it's it's very hard to separate Musk from his companies. All right, so I want to ask that along those lines and his economic might and the economic might he's bringing to Texas. And I'm wondering how much it matters. I mean, world leaders tur in Turkey, India, everybody, you know, France, you know, try to try to woo his business. And I wonder just how big a deal it is for Texas, a state that produces almost six million barrels of oil a day. That's almost four hundred million dollars every single day that comes out of the ground. Does Musk matter? Does his arrival matter much to Texas as an economic engine or is it? Well, you know, it's important to also remember that Texas is the number one producer of wind in the United States and the number two producer of solar. So there is an energy revolution happening and there is an acceleration of the energy transition happening here, even though the state government remains really dominated by petrochemical and kind of fossil fuel companies. But I actually do think, look, the myth of Texas as an untamed frontier is just that. It's a myth. Yes, there's a lot of land, but there's also a lot of Texas that's pretty densely populated and pretty urbanized, as I said. But I do think that the EV revolution speaks to this energy transition, even if it's one that's not explicitly supported by the state. But, Rachel, I do know in chatting with you that, you know, some of Elon's lieutenants who came here to Texas with him from California as part of, hey, you know, we're going to go change Texas and we're going to enjoy the, uh, you know, the libertarian streak in Texas. They have, some of them have since moved on. Is that right? Yeah, and I don't know specifically if these are Elon's lieutenants specifically, right. but I think, you know, just this, this sort of tech world that came in 2020, came to Texas, sort of seeing it as this low tax, low regulation paradise. I, I know that at least some of them are getting fed up. I think the you know, not having the political sway that they wanted. Housing prices are actually like extremely high here. Do housing you know? prices matter for them? I, I mean, I think if you're sort of fantasizing about your, your cheap paradise, it's, yeah. it's not quite that. And well, I'm sure they're seeing the downstream effect, you know, from their employees. Yeah, the summers are employees. brutal. People are leaving for Miami. People are going back to California. You know, people bought these enormous houses and now they're selling their enormous houses. So, I, you know, it's not you're, the lesson we could all learn. Your, your problems follow you wherever you are. You know, you don't get to solve all your problems by just moving to Austin. So The, the problem is not the, 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 like, world movers. Like, they have private jets. If you right. have a private jet, no problem. Yeah, you're good. Uh, it's, their, it's their entourage that does not have a private jet, yeah. would very much like to buy a house, send their kids to school, and so on. And, and like, when you're talking about these Elon Musk, right, potentially trying to hire hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of people like those costs start to add up and it and you start to there's like a trade off between this like yeah. gigantic workforce tech workforce in silicon valley and high costs and that and that gigantic workforce that's still in california i think is um, an important attraction there are a couple of things that could threaten the texas economic boom right one is um, the energy usage we had a near was fatal hundreds of people died but a near complete almost state blackout almost three years ago, about three years ago. And then second, I actually think the social legislation is going to start having an impact on the ability to attract and retain human capital. You know, this is a state where abortion is now criminal with no exceptions, including rape or incest. Obviously, all the stuff around transgender uh, uh, care being prohibited for minors. And I think it's starting, not right away, but it's starting to have an impact on Texas's ability to retain highly skilled employees who are going to be necessary to work for these companies. We're going to go to our last segment. Max, we're going to have fun in this last segment, whether you like it or not. And we're going to put up uh, either some photos for you guys to look at, or we're going to play some audio. And then, you know, I need you guys to, to judge and rate the, you know, the, the, whether this constitute Texas behavior, Texan behavior or not. So uh, let's get the first picture up. Oh, we're back to the hat. Okay, the hat. So my question is for all of you, uh, and then the audience is going to chime in here. Max, is the hat on the right way? So, okay, first of all, I don't know 
because I'm from New York, and you I have never went, worn a cowboy hat in your life. I went down a rab a Reddit rabbit hole on this, and yeah. there are there are diverging views. Some people argue, I think, right. and I'm summarizing, and there are probably people in the audience who may know better than me that that is actually a style that that may oh, yes. look like a hat that just came out of a box and was put on backwards. In fact, it is a hat that just came out of the box but was put on the. So he right knew way. exactly what he was doing. He I looks think. like that on purpose. That's the argument. Okay, kind of so, worse. And so wait a minute. You, and so you seem to buy that. You're going with it. It's on I, the right way. I think way. it's on the right way. Okay. It just looks like he hasn't worn it okay. a whole lot. I would say a wider brim and a more tan color is what you more typically see. But again, there's a lot of self-fashioning going on here. So from the audience, I need to hear it from you if you think the hat is on the right way. Okay, so is it on the wrong way? Okay, all right, so he's 0 for 1. Okay, <laughs> next up. We say uh, all hat and no cattle is a good way that's to insult right. somebody. So that's kind of like all it's cattle and no, no hat, hat is sort well, of the vibe. I just, I feel the need to say because, uh, you know, this is under the aegis of Bloomberg, that Elon Musk actually responded to this critique on Twitter, said he'd own the hat for 10 years, okay. and it's not a new hat. There's uh, no he's way. maintaining There's no way. that this is all, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's just never gone outside in the hat then. But All right, so we, the, it's okay to disagree on this. Podcast. So then the boots, he's got these cow. Can you see the cowboy boots on? He's got the cowboy boots on as he sits down with India's uh, Modi here. Um, Matt, I don't know, Matt. Is this Texas behavior or not, Matt? When you sit down with the with the leader of India, are those the are those the cowboy boots you wear? I th I think it's cool. I don't know. <laughs> you can wear a formal boot for sure. Okay. I authorize it. Yeah, it's hard to see the leather work from here, but for sure, it, it's it's business appropriate. Okay, we're gonna go right to the next clip. I know. What's the? There's like that pizza restaurant, that that pizza chain. That's they have the best ice cream sundae that I've ever seen. It's a giant one. Out here? Oh, Buca de Beppo's. Oh yeah. They, 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 if you, they've got a gigantic ice cream sundae. Everything they have is gigantic. Yeah. It's amazing. Oh, bro, they have that rigatoni, that rigatoni oh, wow. with the meat sauce, and oh my god, Buca de Beppo's is great. It's fantastic. Yeah, and it, it's very reasonably priced for the amount of food you get. Okay, so Rachel, is this the way two Texans talk about food? Because, you know, Texans are very, you know, proud of their food, and there's a strong food culture here. Is this the way two Texans I talk about I mean, maybe it's food? actually really savvy. He's not wading into the Austin versus San Antonio breakfast taco debate. Oh. He's not taking a side. Buca de Beppo, nobody's going to get excited. Nobody's going to get that mad. Oh, so it's, it's safe. You know, so it's, it's the safe, you know, and It uh, also shows like an every, mall like choice. An, an every man sort of quality, right? You know, I go to Buca de Peppos, right? Yeah. I, I, it's weird, so I like it. It's weird, so you like it. You know, on this podcast, I don't know, other people may have listened, but Rogan talks, you know, at great length and with some authority, I'd say, about the food scene in Austin. And this is what Elon offers, which, I mean, I think it suggests that he hasn't gotten out a whole lot. Uh, well, wasn't it during his early days, like at, at, at what would be PayPal and all that, didn't they basically just eat the same thing? Some iteration of Soylent day in and day out. Yeah, I mean, when you're building the future, right, and right. when you're working you're working in this extremely hardcore way, you know, you things fall by the wayside, and you need a gigantic face size portion of spaghetti and meatballs. All right, we got one more that's going to play right now. Why a little buttercup when you stay a while? When you stay a while. And you have a walk of my own by Well, this is really winning. <laughs> so that was Elon and his brother Kimball right here at South by Southwest uh, six years ago. Max, when you hear that, when you hear that, does that sound like Texas? Too? Oh, but by the way, he was still a Californian at the time. That's the issue. Yeah, I think this kind of makes Sewell's he point for him. Right? He would sing it way better. Now. This is this is a cover from the of the Three know. Amigos, I believe. I don't the, know. The I don't Steve know. Does Martin, anybody in the Martin audience Short, know what that is? Uh, I think I think that's what this is. That's uh, Elon's brother, Kimball. Right. Uh, you know, props for putting himself out there. Does any do either you want to touch that? You no. know, it's Rachel's a it's a music town, and so he should probably when leave, in Rome. maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the classic phrase for people who are newly arrived in Texas is, I'm not from here, but I got here as fast as I could. And there's this phenomenon of people yeah. moving to Texas who then see themselves and project themselves as being more Texan than Texas. You might be seeing some of that here right. in uh, 
premonition yeah. kind of way. So to, so to wrap up, um, I want to go back to the beginning. And at the very beginning, Sewell, you uh, assigned Musk a 10. Basically, he's essentially as Texan as Sam Houston to you. And then, oh, and then you gave him an eight, and then Max, who's a, who's a tough SOB, gave him a five. Do any of you want to change your, your votes, your, your well, rating? Well, he's either a 10 or a one, right? There's not much oh, in between. I see. It's one of those. But you're, you're staying with 10. You're not changing the one. Everyone else is good. So I'm going to ask the audience. You know, you're going to get two options here. Uh, the first option is five or lower. So I need to hear if you're going to give Musk a five or lower as a Texan, I need to hear from you, and then the other will be six and up. So who says five or lower? Okay, all right. Solid. Uh, all right, solid. <laughs> T- tougher crowd than uh, up here. How about a six or more? Uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's pretty even draw, which I, it actually does happen to be the right answer because the right answer is 4.7. This was terrific. So let's end it there. A big thanks to our panelists, Max, Rachel, Sewell. And to the audience. And to the audience for joining us. Thank Thank you you all for joining us for this special episode of Elon Inc. at South by Southwest. Keep listening in each and every week. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you.